Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodai, your host for this program. Once again, uh, you and I join together for an hour to sit and relax and listen to a story. And our guest tonight is Catherine Daniels. And she's a special guest. I guess you would call this one of our international journey homes because Catherine has come all the way from England to uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, to join us here on The Journey Home to tell her story, <clears throat> but also she's going to join Doug Keck for a bookmark uh, for the book, The Virgin Eye Towards a Contemplative View of Life. She edited this, and these are the writings of your former husband, your late husband, late husband yeah. excuse me, uh, uh, Robin Daniels. And uh, so, and it's about the, uh, toward a contemplative view of life. And so I, I don't want to talk too much about the book because I want you to be able to share it with Doug on his wonderful program. But let me begin by welcoming you to the journey home. Thank you, Marcus. It's good to be here. It's it's great to be. It would have been nice for me to fly over there and to meet oh. you in your own uh, backyard. But oh. it's good to to have you here. And uh, uh, let me do it like I normally try and do as much as I can. Let's get out of the way, and invite you to go back and uh, and give your former Anglican. So why don't you let the audience uh, start way at the beginning and get a, a glimpse of your journey? Okay. <laughs> Well, I was baptized as a baby in the Anglican Church, um, and my parents were, you know, a loving family, very much in love with one another, and um, so I was brought up with sort of Sunday school, and, uh, but we were quite British, um, you know, faith was quite a private matter, and um, I would say God, it was more God-centered um, than, than Jesus, um, and in my teens, I when I sort of found church boring, I sort of gradually slipped away. Was um, that common amongst your peers? Yes, yeah. I mean, I was at a boarding school, and, oh. and uh, I can remember we would sort of all troop up for communion, and I can remember thinking, well, if I didn't believe in it, I would just not go. And I thought, I, I think I can rely on my conscience. <laughs> and I think probably at that point, I showed God the door. Um, now, now, the boarding schools, were they associated with the Anglican Church? No, um, yeah. we had chapel, um, but it wasn't a sort of dynamic Christian formation. I didn't have That's kind of Bible camps or holidays sort of like formation that, of that sort. Like in the States, we've, we have colleges and schools and such that maybe at one time in the past, 100 years or so, were related to some Christian tradition, then over the years now they've become secularized. And, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing that might have been true for the, you know, all this, you know, we think in the United States we hear about, oh yeah, I've heard of Eaton, I've heard of these old yeah. schools that one time were very much a part of the tradition of the Anglican Church. Yeah. But maybe lost some of their verve yeah. and enthusiasm. Yeah. Okay. Was God a part of your family growing up other than the Sunday morning? For my mom, yes. Um, for my dad, would be more agnostic, um, but very much loves nature. Okay. Um, I was certainly taught to pray as a child, and and I definitely had a belief in heaven because I remember thinking, if I died, my parents would be awfully upset, <laughs> but it would be okay because you know I'll be in heaven. So right. there, there was, I was taught to pray. I had a sort of child, child, childlike faith. Yeah. All right. But uh, being British and being Anglican are very much connected. Yes. Would you say? I mean, yes. in, in your background. Yes. All right. Yeah. But like so many, you gave it the boot when you became a teenager. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And God respected that. And um, at least you think so. Yeah, well, he, he gave me that freedom. <laughs> I think yeah. he gave me that freedom, and <laughs> my life became very much about sort of. Um, driven by grades. I was desperate to get into Oxford. My whole life was predicated on getting A's and um, I didn't get in. That <laughs> was a disaster. Um, and um, I, so I went to Sheffield and I studied and, you know, partied too much and gradually, you know, slipped away. And um, I would say I became quite hard hearted. Hmm. Um, and that although I got the things I wanted, you know, I got the first class, I got into Oxford in the end after my undergrad degree, it was quite hollow. Um, and there was enough in me um, of, of, of Godward seekingness to think I, I want to be a better person. 
no, I want, um, you know, just getting what you want or, um, you know, experiencing things wasn't providing any sort of satisfaction. So I, I did pray. I remembered in university, I'd, I made one prayer looking out the window at the moon, which was something along the lines of, God, I don't believe in you really, no. but if you're real, um, could you give me faith? And by the way, could you make it quite obvious, please? You know, <laughs> so nothing happened from that, but I do believe God heard that prayer. Mm. And I do believe it's, it was important because I it makes me think faith is a gift oh. and to go from zero or, you know, 10% or maybe a bit agnostic um, to having that gift later. Um, I think he answered the prayer. So, so we, we call that grace, of course, mm. you know, the work of God in, in our lives. Mm. You, you were baptized, even though maybe you didn't appreciate it when you were there at Oxford, there's graces that were there. Mm. And uh, what about, and this is, I see this for American audience, uh, we have ideas of England, we may not have all been over there, uh, but again, Oxford was a religious school at one time, very much so, and, and you, it's hard to go anywhere in Oxford without seeing beautiful remnants of the, the great heritage in, in history there. Were you oblivious to that as you were going through that environment, or was that helping, was that feeding you, giving you any idea about the place of, 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 of God in life during that time? Uh, not really. I would say that to some extent the aesthetics can can almost squeeze out God, so that wonderful choral music and people can come sort of a bit taken up with the aesthetic musical experience and forget yeah. God. Um, and certainly when I was at Oxford, I was just thinking um, about myself. Oh. And in fact, I, I, there was a seeking streak in me, but I started to seek in the direction of Buddhism Ah, okay. So when I was at Oxford, I was going along to Buddhist meditation classes and, um, um, yeah, it, I mean, it was a, it was a seeking, but yeah. it was a finding in sort of some shadows of... Well, and your point is, is really well taken. I, I remember when I was doing journey home programs over in Stockholm mm -hmm. and uh, happened to have a, some free time, so uh, one of the producers and I went over to the museum and they happened to have a huge exhibit of old crucifixes and from, you know, a thousand years ago. Mm. It wasn't a religious exhibit at all. Mm. It was all artifacts. It was mm. all antiques. And I suppose that's the way you could be walking through Oxford. This, you're so surrounded by the views of ambiance, mm. but it can just be history. Yeah. Antiques, uh, traditions, and, and almost make you numb to it. But you had a desire for it, so you're looking somewhere. You're going yeah. to Buddhist gatherings. Yes, and I mean it was a step. Um, it was providing something more meaningful than atheism was, yeah. um, you know, a sort of perspective on suffering, uh, a bit more self-awareness, a bit more concentration, um, a, a bit more of a moral framework, mm -hmm. um, a community. Uh, a sense that material things weren't the most important, but it didn't lead to personal transformation, yeah. and it, it didn't introduce me into a relationship with a loving God. So, I mean, I think there are things in Buddhism where, you know, that if I'd pursued it further, you know, with the, the ultimate thing would be the self is an illusion, yeah. um, whereas um, the Christian revelation would be that the, the self is a deeply loved child of God. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that idea from Augustine that our, our heart yearns for God. That yeah. yearning, it's there in us. Yes. And it seems that it was there. It's just we also have another enemy that wants us to fill that void with other things, yes. imitations, yeah. a philosophy that seemed to give it. Yeah. Were you supported by your peers there? Um, I, th uh, I think I, so I found that group out, you know. I, yeah, I okay. Of, yeah. Yeah. All right. So there you are, you're uh, uh, not wearing orange robes or anything, would no. you? <laughs> no. 
So, uh, yeah, well, I would say the next step would be that I asked, while I was there, I, I asked my uncle, I had a birthday coming up, and I asked my uncle for a book by Herman Hesse called Siddhartha. Oh. My uncle's an Anglican vicar, and he very wisely gave me the book by Herman Hesse, which he wouldn't have approved of, uh, but he also gave me a book by a Russian um, peasant from the 19th century called The Way of a Pilgrim. Hmm. So I always like to think I'm, I was kind of converted by a Russian peasant <laughs> who had lived <laughs> a century before me. Hmm. Um, and that book was a real eye-opener because here, what I think I was looking for was a radical path of discipleship, of transformation, hmm. and some sort of peace and well-being. And, and here was a, a, a peasant who, had, who was a homeless wanderer. He'd given up everything. He had no possessions except his knapsack, some dried bread and a Bible. And he was looking for uh, um, how to pray constantly. He'd been struck by that verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, um, pray constantly, yeah. and had said, um, you know, how, how is that possible amidst all the preoccupations of life and earning a livelihood? And he, um, so he had gone in search, and um, this holy man had said, um, he said, what, what does the, what does St. Paul mean? And the holy man had said, ceaseless prayer, constant prayer is a, a, a constant interior yearning of the soul towards God. So you see, Buddhism would be offering something like an awareness and attentiveness in the present moment, which is good. Mm -hmm. And then here was this contemplative tradition in Christianity. I didn't know Christianity had a contemplative no. tradition. <laughs> um, and it was offering something fuller that was, you know, relational, not just being attentive to myself, to, but to a relational yearning towards a God who loves me. Uh, but I mean, I didn't get that far there and then, but it started to sow some seeds. And when I think about the two comparisons that you're at that point being drawn to the Buddhist in this wonderful way of the pilgrim. Mm. I'm thinking of a dripping faucet, this water dripping out, where the, the contemplative life from a Buddhist standpoint would almost be turn that faucet off until there's nothing flowing. You have nothing left. Mm. And so you have the total emptiness of that. Mm. Whereas the, cat, the Christian view is turn that faucet on. Yeah. You know, the flowing of, of the reality of God into our lives. Yeah. There's the fullness. Contemplative prayer is this constant the you know, flowing of the, the living water of Christ versus yeah. nothing. Yeah. Turn it off. Emptiness. Emptiness. Yeah. A, a, ultimately, annihilation mm -hmm. versus, you know, continually remembering God. So, yeah. Right. So, uh, so you're in the midst of that. Uh, did you read both books or just the I read one? both books. Yeah. <laughs> I can't remember Siddhartha at all, but the Russian peasant stayed with me. Huh. Um, I, w I went to China um, to teach English. And because, you know, I was into every experience. So um, and in China, I had a neighbor who was an evangelical Christian. Hmm. And I am eternally grateful to my evangelical friends, really, for uh, because the biggest step was the step towards Jesus, really. Hmm. Now, I was going along to some Buddhist monk occasionally to talk and doing my Buddhist thing. Um, and she, she was really living the walk. She was in China because she thought God wanted her to be there. And um, she said, she, we would have conversations and she said, Catherine, just keep looking for the truth. Now, I didn't agree that she had it and I didn't. I thought truth was a relative thing, but I couldn't object to that. And I think more than anything that she said, the thing that made the biggest difference was what she did. Because mm. she invited me and my atheist friends to her house, her, her flat for Christmas. And she, for, she forewent her own Christmas with her Christian friends in a nice kind of holy mm. huddle. And it was really sacrificial. Um, and that more than anything she said made 
a real mark, you know, a real impact, I think. Our guest is Catherine Daniels. She's a former Anglican and, and the editor of her um, a departed husband, Robin Daniels' writings in a book called The Virgin Eye. Now, this, this invitation of your atheist buddies to this wonderful evangelical Christian, did, uh, did, w w was there an aspect of that gathering for Christmas when she's telling you the story of Christmas or she's conveying that, or was it just her act of friendship? Was the act of sacrifice, you know, of going without Christmas with her friends, Terry, and I think she did go to church, but right. yeah, and uh, she, she, it was the sacrifice, yeah. So shall I roll sure. on to yes, the yes, yes. next bit? Um, so Jesus, the, the reality of Christ becomes real, as it at least starts at that point? No. Okay. No, it took, I was a hard nut to crack. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, but it was a chink of openness. Uh -huh. And I went back to England. I went and trained uh, in law school. And I became aware that Buddhism, for all its um, stated purpose of of that I, you know, dying to self, I realized that I was quite pleased about being a bit, well, I wasn't really a Buddhist. I hadn't signed on the dotted line, but I was quite pleased about it. Um, it had a sort of bohemian cachet about it. <laughs> and I recognized that if that search was about anything, it wasn't about puffing myself up. And uh, the Dalai Lama himself had said that Westerners did better when they saw within their own faith traditions. Yeah. Um, so I thought, okay, I better, I better give my own faith tradition a go. Uh, so I'll sort of fast forward a bit, but it ended up being that I, I wrote to my uncle, the same one who gave me the book, and said, where can I learn to pray? Because there was this yearning for prayer. I mean, that's what the Buddhist search was right. about as well. Um, you wanted to be in touch with the reality of a God, if there's a God, if there's some being. I mean, that's what you were searching for. It wasn't details of a religion. Not details of a religion. It was sort of peace and becoming a better person and yeah. being transformed. Right. Yeah. I guess it was holiness, yeah. I would say now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I wasn't. Um, I probably wanted a technique as well. So now, whereas now I would see prayer much more as a relationship. And the way of the pilgrim had also connected with that. I mean, that's what yeah. that's about how to this uh, regular relationship with God. Yes, you know, a constant. The, the way of the pilgrim. I forgot to say he he finds this staret, an orthodox holy man, who teaches him the Jesus prayer. Yeah. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. sinner. And he he prays this prayer constantly. So and. That idea was very, very attractive. So, th and I apprehended that if I was to learn to pray, I needed to go to a place where people believed in God. Uh, so I went to a community in France called the Chemin Neuf. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of them? No. Mm -hmm. um, they were founded by a Jesuit, Laurent Fabre, and um, as part of this great flowering of lay movements in France last century. Mm -hmm. And they had an Ignatian spirituality, but an ecumenical charism. So you had Lutherans, Pentecostals, Presbyterians, Anglicans, Catholics, Orthodox, all worshiping um, together, studying. I did, you know, manual work, and and I signed up for an Ignatian six-day retreat. <laughs> now, was this at your uncle's advice to go there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. In France. All right. There um, so that was quite a hairy thing to do, because you have to bear in mind, I was an agnostic. I've read Brother Lawrence by this point. Um, and so I'm open to God, but Jesus is really an enlightened sage, probably. Right. But, but a, probably a good teacher, so I'm willing to listen. But I mean, so really, you know, the, the lady who was accompanying me, she said, Catherine, you know, it is a choice between life and death. And I thought, gosh, that's a bit, <laughs> she's putting it a bit strongly. <laughs> um, but I mean, that, that's true. Yeah. So I went on this retreat. We were taught the um, Ignatian thing whereby you 
uh, pray for a grace before you meditate with a gospel. Right. And I am, um, I was having some judgmental thoughts about the community setup. So instead of doing the recommended grace, I said, um, God unblock me. But, and um, I prayed with a passage from Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel 36 to 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. So I prayed, God unblock me. And I felt like um, a plunger came in, down into me. I mean, I, the state of my soul was probably pretty much like a latrine. <laughs> and, I, and I felt God physically unblocked me. And we heard testimonies. We, heard, we met young people who had given their lives to Christ, who'd opted for celibacy, for, for Jesus. <laughs> so, and we were encouraged to make our offerand, offering, um, whereby we invited Jesus to take the driving seat. And uh, I, I did that. So, um, yeah. That. Well, first of all, you said you didn't pray for the grace you did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what Lord Unblock Me is all about, right? I mean, yeah. you may not realize at the time, but that's what you're saying, Lord. Hey, mm. you know, uh, and, and so you, you invite Christ into your life. Mm -hmm. was, was, was there an experience of it there in the midst of that? Um, there was after I went back and prayed in the chapel with a friend. Also prayed with Filipino friends, the rosary. I was hungry for everything. Loved the, you loved the office. And uh -huh. um, we prayed with them um, a verse from John. Um, I want you to dwell in me. Um, and I only remember it in French, but you know, uh, and I in you as the grape dwells on the Oh, in John vine. 15, yeah, yeah, abide in me and abide in... Uh, but, yeah. And, yeah. So I um, prayed that and I did, I did feel... Um, overwhelmed with peace um, and so uh, I, it, I can't really explain but right. I associated that experience with Jesus because it was in a chapel right. and I, I don't remember any metanoia moment where I said gosh you are God but there certainly was an intellectual and faith shift where I thought who is he? Is he, you know, was he just a wise sage, mm. or was he, or was he, was he uh, deceiving people, or uh, de um, deceived himself, or was he really who he said he was? Was he God? And um, I, I just came to know he was. Hmm. Yeah. yeah like and things changed, you know, in a way that they hadn't changed from my own efforts at personal improvement through. Buddhist meditation and so on. Was, was that time that you were there, were there instructions, basic Christian instructions that were helping you kind of move forward and understanding at least who the church taught about Christ? Or was it mainly more experiential in that environment? There was, it was a great instructive environment. I, I, I think in hindsight, it's a pity I didn't stay longer. Mm -hmm. I was signed up for, for law school. Um, I said, so what happens now? Do I become a Catholic? And they said, no, no, you go back to your Anglican church, yeah. which uh, in hindsight, I think, hey, you really sold me short, guys. But, um, but it was an ec ecumenical it environment. Was ecumenical. So it, it was appropriate. I yeah. can understand why. They, they weren't inviting people in order to kind of pull everyone over to become Catholics. Right. You know? So... Um, so, um, so C.S. Lewis says he's either a, a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Yeah. Right, so you'd gone the journey, at least he's not a liar, mm -hmm. and not a lunatic, but you, but Lord yet? Yeah, Lord, Lord, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he became the total center, really, and my life changed. I didn't want to be drinking too much because I wanted to pray. I called all my friendships into question. Um, it called my vocation, my life path into question. It, upset the whole apple cart in the most wonderful, amazing way. Yeah. 
um, <clears throat> the danger of retreats is often then when the coal leaves the fire and goes back to real life, sometimes it's hard to keep that coal going. Did you arrive back in England with support? Um, well, I came, I, I went back initially to the Quaker meeting house I've been going to. And then I realized, because the only gospels we were being encouraged to read were the gospels of Thomas and Mary, <laughs> the apocryphal. Right. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can remember giving, I, I ended up giving some, Thing that I'd learned on the Ignatian, I thought this is no good. I can't be trying to lead others. I need to be nurtured myself. Mm. So I found a nice Anglican church with a mixed um, white and African community. Yeah. I don't think I, I, we had a Net for God group from Shaman Nerf that was nurturing and supportive. But I don't think, this is why I said it might have been good to stay in France. It might have been good to do a year there yeah, yeah. and have their formation program because um, I probably didn't get brilliant catechesis um, really until quite a lot later when I, yeah. Well, one of the problems, I mean, ecumenical groups uh, are wonderful in that we're learning to love each other and understand what unites us, hopefully with a long-term journey let's eventually be united mm. in the church. But the negative of an ecumenical group is uh, you have to be careful of your theology. So it can mm -hmm. be very, very thin. Mm -hmm. It can be about Jesus, but there's no sacraments. There's, you know, what do you do? There's, mm -hmm. there, there, and so even if you stayed in formation, sometimes those groups can be limited, mm -hmm. held back and, and the fullness of what they would give you. But uh, why don't we pause now, uh, Catherine, let's take a break. Uh, you're back in England, you, you've gotten a, at least Jesus is Lord, mm. either with a capital L or at least a little L. Uh, oh, he's he, a capital L. Okay, yeah. so he's a capital yeah. L. You, you're definitely one of his disciples at this point, but wanting yeah. to grow dear. So let's come back in a break and let's find out. Uh, at this point, it sounds like you're getting ready to start law school, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's come back and talk yeah. about that in a bit. Here. Our guest is Catherine Daniels. We'll see you in a bit. We'll hear more about her journey. back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Catherine Daniels, former Anglican, and uh, she's the editor of the book called The Virgin Eye Towards a Contemplative View of Life, which is a collection of her husband's stories, Robin Daniels. And we're going to jump back into your journey. In fact, we might hear a little bit about Robin coming up, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm back in England. Um, yeah. I'm I'm starting to walk and I'm starting to develop a friendship with Jesus in a gentle, gradual way. And he's ringing a lot of changes in, in my life. Mm. And, um, and it's at this point that I, um, I met uh, Robin. So I mm. went to this, uh, I went to a quiet day called The Poet's Eye, similar to the title of the book, The yeah. Virgin Eye. Um, and so, so called because he, wanted, he was encouraging us to see life the way the poet or artist sees, um, you know, to see with wonder and freshness. And uh, he opened the, the talk with the words, all time is God's time. So, I mean, that struck me because most men didn't, didn't talk like that. <laughs> um, and he was somebody who inhabited time in a different way. Hmm. He, was, he was very slow, he was very centered, he, um, yeah, he was very grateful. Um, so anyway, so I was, I, I got to know him gradually. I didn't fall in love with him straight away. Um, but I could tell he really had something quite special about him. And um, essentially, yeah, uh, after getting to know him for about a year, um, I realized I'd fallen in love with him. The only catch was that he was about twice my age. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I just want to say, for the sake of you, so no one like, he, he wasn't previously married and he hadn't taken any vows, okay? <laughs> I just want to say that because sometimes people think, you know, take, take our relationship as an encouragement 
and when it might not be a good idea. Um, but Robin was like had lived a really very pure life, um, and was his whole life was seeking God. Hmm. And uh, so I realised I'd fallen in love with him, and then had this choice. You know, you hadn't been in love before, so okay, it wasn't like ticking the boxes I had in my head of what it would be like when I met this Mr. Wright. He did have all the personal qualities, but you know, I had imagined <laughs> um, someone my own age. Um, but he was, I suppose, you know, I mentioned the way of the pilgrim and yeah. he found his little starrets. And I suppose it was Robin's wisdom, really, that, that drew me. <laughs> um, and I suppose Robin, so Robin was husband, best friend but also in a way kind of starrets <laughs> you know he he um well he opened my eyes up to things like poetry and betty davis films and <laughs> um you know chesterton and great english literature and the sort of cultural aesthetic life but he also opened me up to um the inner life um you know he was a psychotherapist so um, you know, this whole sense that one can um, have quite an active inner life and that it, um, it's good to be self-aware um, and to be in touch with feelings. Um, that was a bit of a kind of eye-opener for me. And he was a mature Christian, so mm. he was... Um, prob yeah, he was probably the most profound influence on my learning what it meant to walk the Christian life. Yeah. Now, w was he an evangelical Anglican? He was an Anglican, more of the sort of Book of Common Prayer type ah, school. Okay. But, and as you see in the book, he, um, he'd he been writing that for 20 years. <laughs> you know, it, it, this was one of the things appealing about him. He was a man with a mission, and he would be faithful to his time at the desk every day. Um, and all the minds that had nourished and influenced him were pretty well Catholic hmm. saints. St. Francis de Sales, he loved. St. Teresa, St. John of the Cross, and St. Thomas Kemp. Well, no, he's not a saint. Thomas Kemp. Thomas Kemp. Um, so, and when I look at his library and the books that are underlined, like I'll find something by Escriva and it's underlined, um, not to be too curious about other people's business. And I think, Robin put that into practice. Hmm. So he, he wasn't a ver he didn't voraciously read just for knowledge. He read slowly, and he and he put it into practice. <laughs> so um, so yes. So to answer your question, he was an Anglican, but very Catholic in his spiritual life. Mm. Okay, okay. So after a year or so, did uh, you or he pop the question? He popped the question. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I didn't need to think about it. I just knew. Uh, so we married. And um, we moved to the north of England. So I think sometimes maybe when people move, that can be a time when you sort of, your expectations about your churchmanship can be loosened up to some extent. Um, so we did a bit of church hopping, um, looking for the right sort of place where we fitted. Um, I ought to say that ever since that time in France, it had been all things Catholic that appealed to me. So I would cycle uh, past the, the Maltese sisters on the way to work and I would say the office with them. I would go to the city for mass during the daytime and lunch when I was training, when I was doing my articles. Um, I would go to, to retreats, at Catholic retreat houses. I had a Catholic spiritual director. <laughs> so it was all things Catholic that were drawing me, um, but I, hadn't made the leap. Uh, I've met some Anglicans that just considered themselves Catholic and didn't really see the distinction. I'm not this brand of Catholic in line with the Pope, but I'm this brand of Catholic, our branch of Catholicism. Were yeah. you of that ilk? Um, I wasn't theologically informed about it, but I would say yes. And I didn't, I sort of thought, I was, it was a bit of a proud thing, but I sort of thought, well, I believe in this stuff and I believe in the real presence. and. Kind of, what, well, why should I? Yeah. And I don't, yeah, so I think I didn't realize that, what were the significant differences. All right, all right. Yeah. As a lifelong Brit, were you familiar with the history of the division 
Anglican Catholic? Um, I mean, my the, te the teaching I, I had, the teaching I had, kind of from school was, you know, nasty popes selling indulgences. Um, I, I suppose the pope was a bit in my ha head was a bit of a kind of blend of King Kong, <laughs> Goring. Uh, you know, there was yeah. some conditioning, probably from from my Englishness and this yeah. sense of not wanting to be ruled Bloody by Mary, foreigners. Bloody Mary and all these nasty Catholics and what they did to us. And so that yeah. was the best thing that ever happened in England was breaking free. It's a sort of liberty, yeah. yeah. Uh, not to say that my parents were sort of vocal in that regard, but I think there was a sort of, just culturally you yeah. sort of imbibed a certain amount. Um, and um, Robin was on the same page? No, I mean, not. Robin also, I would say, didn't, realized there was a big difference. So mm -hmm. like, to give you an example, we would go to the mass and uh, when we were church hopping and say, this is lovely, don't they celebrate the mass with devotion? You know, and yeah. I, certainly Robin loved the popes. You know, when I go through his papers, there's like all things about Pope Paul VI and all these books. I'm thinking, why didn't you do it sooner? <laughs> but I think maybe he just didn't realize what some of the differences were. But also, oh. also, He's a good example of someone maybe like Evelyn Underhill would be another, or Brother Ramon, a Franciscan, Anglican Franciscan. There are a lot of great Anglicans yep. who really love the Catholic um, saints and um, nourish by that and nourish by their Bible time, their prayer life, and they're putting it into practice. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, and a part of this cultural thing uh, at least it's here in the States, I'm assuming it's there, is that what's important is your faith in Christ, your faith in God, living that out. What church you belong to is not really that crucial. Yeah, I think that's true. And so it might have been, we would go to the Baptist one and the Methodist one, and it was more about whether the preaching was good or whether we felt comfortable. And, and also, is this an environment where we will grow? Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you, you know, that group over there, how wonderful the art, music and the artwork and the ambiance, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I have a mandate to go over and join them? Well, not necessarily. I mean, that's, that's what we got here in the States, too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's me and Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, what church? So it's hard to get people to realize, you know, maybe there is a significance. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that, that might be true on your side of the pond, too. <laughs> well, it, it is, but I have to say, I mean, Nat, I subsequently studied at Maryvale, so I, I have wrestled with some of those things, like, yeah. you know, did Christ found a church, and, you know, what, what's the basis of authority? But those things weren't the things that drew me. Yeah. I had to become a Catholic because I had to receive the Eucharist. That, 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 it was as simple as that. That was the that. issue, okay. I, I had to receive the Eucharist. I wasn't allowed to unless I became a Catholic, and it was so important. I just knew... I knew it was Jesus, and um, it was kind of a, it was, I don't know why I didn't do it sooner. When, when did you start realizing the reality of Christ in the Eucharist? I had it happened back at France? In it? France. Okay. In France. And then, I mean, to keep going yeah. every day to Mass, and you know, so I just think I, yeah, so I had a deep conviction, but there was also a bit of a, I believe, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Mm -hmm. Because I think that an Anglican, I don't know if it's just me or if it's a generic thing, but one can be in a difficult conundrum because to come into the Catholic Church, you, you say something like, I believe everything that the, Holy, the Catholic Church teaches to be true. Right. And that, at the time, that struck me as a very high bar, especially since all the Catholics I knew didn't didn't believe a whole heap of things. And I, when I did enter, did I, had I squared everything? I don't know that I'd squared everything. I think I had more just reached a position of sub surrender, whereby I was willing to say, I trust you guys to work this out better than me. <laughs> and sort of where, where my belief is inadequate, Lord, help thou my unbelief. So, but what, where the, the paradox is, and I think it's a hard, Graces to believe the things I found difficult only came through coming into full communion with the church and receiving the sacraments. So now I believe everything the church teaches, yeah. but from within. So. Well, that's the tradition from Augustine on, faith 
seeking understanding, not yeah. the other way around. Yeah. You know, we often think it's the other way around. And once I understand it all, then I'll believe, well, yeah. oh, no, it's faith seeking understanding. Yeah. Was your husband Robin on the same page in terms of the Catholic Church? Well, we would have these, um, we would have these um, walks, and um, I was, you know, all up for this. And and we, the things that I found difficult, were, we would we would be having a conversation, and I would say, well, Robin, what do you think about this? You know, if someone dies and they're not quite ready to go straight into heaven, do you think it's heaven or hell, or do you think there might be a purifying process? You know, if there's just, and he would say, oh, definitely, you know, purgatory. Well, so. There would be other things. He was very attracted to the Marian dimension, uh, the wisdom and tradition on family values and the solid authority and, and the devotional life, you know, that both of us were so drawn to the contemplative tradition and wisdom, you know, to have a church with figures like St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa, St. Therese, yeah. St. Francis. And there's not just a handful of them. There are hundreds. Yeah. So. I think for Robin, it was two things. I think it was realizing that on all the important issues, he actually already held the Catholic position, the real presence, certainly. Um, but secondly, when Pope Benedict came to Britain, that touched us both because, mm. you know, we, he was so palpably holy. Um, and one had this sense that popes were kind of laying down the law and telling you what to do. And he was a very humble man with a certain confidence about who he was. And, yeah. Our guest is Catherine Daniels. Um, so uh, was there a sense that one of you was farther along in the journey than the other? One was a little like C.S. Lewis kicking and screaming a little bit or? Uh, no, Ro I mean Robin was way, way farther ahead spiritually than me. He was really, he really was a holy person, mm -hmm. grateful all the time, no, total control of his tongue. You know, he never <laughs> said anything irritable or indiscreet. <laughs> so, you know, quite an exceptional person. So he was f definitely way ahead of me. But in terms of initiating the Catholic um, journey, that would be more my initiative. And he kind of surprised me when he said, actually, I'm coming in with you. <laughs> What was the final thing that finally convinced you and also Robin to, that this, you got to make the leap? The mass. So, I mean, I, I work with, um, I'm a play therapist, um, although I quit the job to edit the book. But I'm a play therapist, so I work with children with emotional difficulties. And I did work with children who were bereaved. Hmm. And we would get them to make memory boxes and uh, to remember their lost loved one. And, you know, Jesus knows he's dying and he knows people, his disciples, his friends are going to miss him unbelievably. Uh, but he doesn't just like leave you a sort of ritual, a memento, um, a photo, a symbol. He, he, he's, he's, he leaves us away. He leaves us himself. So, you know, to say I'm going to descend to become bread and it'll actually be me. Um, <laughs> It's so simple, only God could think of it. Um, and so I think, I mean, if we, we've heard children say, I love you so much I could eat you. <laughs> and it's almost like Jesus sort of knows that pr primitive way of loving that we have. Or um, I said, I, I haven't shared this, I'm about to share it on international television. <laughs> but, um, I, I would say to Robin, feel, you know, I wish I could live in your tummy. <laughs> you know, that, that, that sort of an expression of how intimate mm. one wants to be with a person one loves. Yeah. And so Jesus comes into that degree of intimacy by becoming, by becoming bread. And we can consume him and yeah. he can turn us into him. So it was that, that was, that was not on offer elsewhere other apart from the Orthodox Church. So. Yeah, there's a, a, a classic movie in America called It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. It's about, it's, about, it's a wonderful story uh, yeah. about Christmas, what life would be like without you if you never lived and you realized God had used your life in so many different ways. But in that story, when he gets back with his children, the first thing he says, I, I could eat you up. Oh, yeah. That's an expression of his absolute just, he cannot express how much 
He wants his children. And that's what you're talking about, yeah. is this intimacy that we have with Christ. Yeah. And, uh, and Robin was the same. Then. Yeah. yeah. He was so grateful, you know, just to be Catholic. It was just like it was like getting on a trampoline, you know, in terms of our spiritual life. It was, um, what do you say in America? You call it a candy store. It was like going into a candy store, you know, in terms of... Well, there's, yeah, there's this long journey we hear then of a, you desiring this intimacy. God uses a variety of different things to touch you the, the way of the pilgrim. And, and then that all to have this uh, more of a contemplative view of life. Mm. And, you know, talk about this book a little bit. I know I want to just, you talk most about that with Doug when you do the, the bookmark. But in, you did this after your husband. Talk a bit about that, if you would. Yeah, well, so he um, he had been writing it all along when I was um, when I knew him, and we. Um, but the thing is, it was long, it, and we had struggled to get a commercial publisher because of the length. So he died uh, quite suddenly in 2012 to mm -hmm. bronchopneumonia. Um, so it was a shock. I mean, he was yeah. a lot older than me, but it was he was too young to die. Yeah. And I was left with this treasure and knowing that I had had a unique privilege really in, in being married to this exceptional man. <laughs> and that all he'd taught me and his philosophy, which was very private, he didn't share it uh, with others, he didn't speak about himself, um, was in this book. And it, it, was, it was too good to keep to myself. Um, so I took, after about two years, I, um, I took the plunge. I, I quit my job uh, because to immerse yourself in another person's thought, you know, you have to give it a lot of yeah. time. Yeah. And it, it's very much, his, it's all his words. It, it's um, the only th sort of editorial input would have been sort of excising some repetitions or um, moving some things mm -hmm. under sort of certain chapter headings. And um, but yeah, it's a cont do, do you want me to say, sorry, but well, I, I, I want to we're tweaking the interest of our audience to make sure they go to your interview with Doug Keck when you mm. do the, the, the bookmark. So I want to save a lot of that for that. Mm. What I'm interested in for this book, was it a continuation of your journey? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, the journey begins with a search for prayer, doesn't it? Well, yeah. a, a search for prayer, certainly in, in some shadows and so I kind of came to a cul-de-sac, but then through the way of the pilgrim. And what I would say is that this book and immersing myself in Robin's thoughts on prayer was joining up a circle. So, you know, the Buddhists would be talking about mindfulness and to be mindful is very good, but who are we mindful of? <laughs> so this book was like in introducing me to um, r recollection, to, you know, to w ways of finding God in other people in prayer, making little arrow prayers. They're not all new things. These are, right. these are the riches and treasures of our Catholic yeah. tradition, but um, finding- If they're completely brand new, then they ought to be suspicious. Yeah. Yeah, this, these connect with the wealth, the, as you said, the, the great tradition that we take for granted too often. Yeah. We have to take the time to learn. Yeah. So, and, and there are little helpful things, you know, like Robin was big on humility and keeping your things about your spiritual life very private. Um, he's good on, I, you know, really questioning your motivation. So what I feel like is it's a bit like the alabaster jar. It's almost like the alabaster jar had to be broken in mm. order for the fragrance of mm. Robin's life to be poured out both for me, but also for like other people I'm seeing it touch other people's lives. So. You came to know him more after? Yeah, yeah, some things I would say Parts I, knew, of him. I knew more, like it, he writes a lot about doing little things with love. So I knew that from experience. I knew the experience of coming back late at night and finding the outside light had been turned on. I knew that you know, when I was starting a new course of studies, he would have gone out and bought some files or <laughs> you know, little things. But to see his philosophy sort of 
summed up and why he did things and how it was the intention and the motivation that was important and how you should keep those things hidden. If, oh. but those are all things that I learned in the book. You learn more about maybe the whys behind what he, you had experienced him doing for you yeah. all the time. Yeah, and the potential pitfalls in the journey and how to safeguard against those. Uh, as we talked about earlier, there are many Anglicans that uh, just think of themselves as Catholic. Why do I need to make the jump? You know, mm. I'm, I'm fine here. All the different flavors of Anglicanism. And that those, those high church folk over there are just a higher view of Anglicanism. But talk about really the distinction about being Catholic versus your Anglican past. What, is, what would you say there really makes the big difference for you in being Catholic? as opposed to your Anglican past? Okay, well, I think there's, there, are, there are two, possibly three things. W one is, is Christ really present in the Blessed Sacrament? You know, in jo does he mean what he said in John 6? You know, my flesh is real food, my yeah. blood is real drink. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you cannot have life in you. So does, did he, does he mean what he said? You know, when he said, this is my body, uh, this is my blood, D did he mean it literally? Mm. And, so th and the Catholic Church, of course, and the Orthodox say, yes, yes, he did. So that, that's number one. And, and if he did mean it, does it matter? Like, is it so important an issue that we're not prepared to fudge it? You know, that we're, mm. it's worth dying for. Um, mm. And people have. So that, that's issue number one. Issue number two is, um, did Christ found a church? And it's not a comfortable question necessarily to ask. Um, I've, I had my baggage about popes and rules, and as I've said, um, but when I searched it out, I felt quite uncomfortable about whether the queen was head of the church. Now, I love the queen, you know, she's great, I love her speech. She's a, she's a strong Christian and she's saying it every Christmas, but still, you know, did, was that the hierarchical arrangement Christ made? And mm. I didn't see that in the Bible. So I suppose going back to basics, you know, it was that Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. So then you are like, okay, well, what did he mean? You know, so, but having said that, I, this wasn't, I wasn't really looking, searching all this out at the time, but I think, you know, to know that that, the one church that traces its roots right back to Jesus's time, and that the popes have existed in total continuity to the present day. And also from a common sense view, I mean, we're in America. When your founding fathers created the institution of presidency, did they create it to endure for one generation only? No, right. of course they didn't. Right. So when Christ says, I give you the keys, I give you governing authority, Isaiah, uh, 22, 22 gives yeah. governing authority to Eliakim, gives him the keys, symbolic of the office of prime minister. Um, he, he, in, I think he intends that institution to continue because he knows what we're like. Yeah. Yeah. He knows okay. we'll squabble and. So you said the Eucharist and the church, was there a third thing or was that? The Eucharist, the church, uh, the third would be, um, sanctification, you know, that we have these great doctors of the church because they believe really transformation in Christ is possible. Um, you know, that we are called to ever greater degrees of holiness and uh, they're just awesome. They're just filled with all this wisdom on prayer and growing in virtue. So. And they all teach that it's a, this mystical partnership between the graces we receive through the church and the sacraments but also our responding to those. Mm. You know, it's a both and, you know, mm. our growing and intimacy and contemplative life is a both and. It's not a magic thing that mm. uh, kind of happens to us. It's a both and, this, this partnership. Mm. Some Christian traditions want to say it's, it's, it's just the stuff. Others want to say, no, it's just all the intellect, or, but it's a both and, it's mm. the beauty of that. Catherine, thank you for joining us on the journey thank home. You, thank you for coming all the way over here and sharing your journey and our prayers are with you. Uh, and uh, thank you for doing this work of bringing together your husband's writings, The Virgin Eye, 
towards a contemplative view of life. Thank you for editing that. And I do pray that that book touches a lot of people. Thank and you. And that's why we write books, yeah. right? Uh, to pass on the good stuff, to change other people's lives. Thank you for doing that. And again, I want to remind the audience that uh, 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 Catherine will be doing an interview with Doug Keck on this book in his bookmark program. So I want to make sure you look for that when it appears at EWTN. Thank you. I, I hope that Catherine's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.